Superior and Ontario, they were volcanic formed, basalt rock, and uh, I'm not going to get into that, but it, it's a very interesting uh, subject. You can Google it on, on the uh, uh, internet, and you'll you'll find a lot of uh, information on how these lakes were formed. And the uh, three lakes, the interior lakes here, Erie, Hudson, uh, Huron, and Michigan, were formed. They were oceans. They're part of the ocean. Of course, all of them were. But there's absolutely tremendous salt deposits beneath those three lakes. I mean, hundreds of feet deep. So a hundred times these, these lakes were flooded with ocean water, salt water. And uh, that's why we have those deposits. Very interesting story, but I won't get into it now. The watershed itself comes off the Tug Hill. Uh, we do have a couple reservoirs now, uh, early uh, 20th century. Uh, it was originally a, a, a brook trout watershed with uh, spawning uh, landlocked salmon and spawning lake trout. Because back then in Lake Ontario, there were seven varieties of lake trout that had different little niches in the lake, and some of them were river spawning fish. They're gone now. So I think there's two species of lake trout left from those original stocks. But a lot of you have fished the, the river, so I'm not going to spend any time on it. This is a, a beautiful body of water. This is the upper reservoir. It is a tremendous fishery. Ralph and I were up there last year, and he caught a walleye on a, on a fly. So I thought that was pretty spectacular. So uh, I have a camp down here on the, on the reservoir. And it's for sale if anybody's interested in the three acre home <laughs> on the reservoir. But uh, what you see is a really unique lake. There is no cottages on this lake. 90 95% is owned by the uh, state. So there's only a few places there's cottages. So it is a remarkable, pristine lake. It's a warm water fishery now, although it started out as a trout fishery. Somebody put in. Uh, uh, smallmouth bass, and that's the fishery now, and the state is stocking walleyes, although occasionally there's some, uh, there, there is a trout pot. Uh, there's very good crappie fishing, and it's, it's just a beautiful place to fish. If you don't catch a fish, it's beautiful. And there's a great bar in, in the town there, just, just saying. <laughs> This is the uh, upper reservoir dam, Redfield Dam. And I put this in here uh, because you see the, the dried up flow. And up until 1995, these were high capacity generators. And the dominant use, the only use really was, was generation of, of, of electricity. So they would run those generators till they couldn't run them anymore. And then they'd stop the flow and fill the reservoir back up which interrupted uh, or destroyed any natural reproduction of trout or salmon and also interrupted the bug life cycle. So it was just a terrible natural disaster to outdoorsmen. So uh, 1995, the uh, state, uh, I'm sorry, the federal government made the power companies sit down with the stakeholders. There were 26 different stakeholders, outdoors, campers, kayakers, fishermen, and uh, they came to an agreement with the power companies that three times a year, there'd be a different minimal water flow. The lowest flow is in the summer, 185 cubic feet per second. And that maintains the natural reproduction, which is huge in Salmon River. Over 50% of our fish are naturally reproduced. And it also uh, supports the bug life cycle. So it's a, just a tremendous success story for the federal government doing something for us. Going down river uh, a couple miles is the falls. If you get a chance to go to the falls, it's a great place. There's a, a walkway and there's posters telling you what's going on. It's 100 feet, 120 feet wide. It's even beautiful in the winter. It's just a great place to stop. Uh, you see here a nuclear egg. I, I, don't, I don't fish that too much, but I have guests that, that fish exclusively that nuke egg. They won't take it off. The nuke egg they fish is a uh, orange egg and a chartreuse veil. I got a guy coming up uh, Wednesday and he'll have his nuke eggs with him. And of course the uh, sucker spawn is very popular. 
in the DSR in April, at the end of the steelhead spawn, the suckers run out of the lake. And these are big fish. There's some 10 pound suckers run up and they spawn and that will hold these drop back steelhead in the river, in that lower river. So sucker spawn can be a good, uh, a good fly for you at that point in time. You down river, you have the lower reservoir. Uh, I got a flesh fly there, a rabbit flesh fly. Flesh flies I use a lot in November, December, and January, <laughs> but the flesh fly will work almost any time of the year. I, I'm real, real, I use that white death now for my flesh flies almost exclusively, but you can use whatever you have confidence in. This uh, Light Hill Reservoir, the lower reservoir, the problem here for the river is it's small. I'm sorry? This is a small, 164 acres. So when the, the guy that manages this dam for the power company, this is the last uh, watershed he checks at night before he goes to bed because there's no wiggle room. The way the geography is set up, if there's any rainfall that drains immediately into this reservoir, it's small. So you'll get some uh, overflow over this uh, secondary, this, this side of the dam, this overflow dam. The problem there is, uh, is especially this time of year, they're steelhead in the river getting ready to spawn. They get attracted to that side of the, of the river. They get into that current flow. The water flow's controlled, it goes back to the main dam and those fish get, uh, get caught over there. They get trapped. And I've been over there with, with a half dozen guys and we've taken 50 steelhead and taken them back to the main, the main stem. So uh, they don't like to do that, but they don't have a lot of wriggle room. They can't control the flow. Uh, most of it is determined by the, the rainfall or the snow melt. So they can't, they support the fishery as much as they can, but they don't have uh, a lot of uh, uh, a wiggle room at all, so. You get downstream, you have the upper fly zone, which is open from uh, 1 April to 30 November. Uh, they close that to support spawning upstream so those fish are undisturbed. Uh, and then you've got the hatchery. That hatchery is supposed to go to another watershed, but uh, a state senator, who Doug Barkley, who owns a DSR, he was able to uh, get that uh, built on, on the Salmon River, which is definitely a help. So. That's a mop fly up there. I do tie mop flies and I do fish them. And my best summer fly for uh, smallmouth bass uh, is a is a mop fly, and uh, tied with cream and uh, and, and uh, so a little brown a hackle. But it's been a really good fly for me. The uh, I I do fish for steelhead too. I fish an orange uh, uh, mop and a uh, blue. Uh, uh, Hackle, so that's a good fly. Okay, you've got the uh, lower fly zone. Good picture here, looking at the bridge. I put this in here. This is the stone flies you see this time of year. You'll look back on the snow bank when you're fishing, two in the afternoon when it's warmed up, and you'll see swarms of these 16, number 18 stone flies on, on the bank. So uh, it's a stone fly rich river. Part of it is the salmon carcasses. These salmon come up out of the lake. They're big fish. You know, they average some years uh, over 20 pounds and they, they spawn and die, all right? What they bring with them is a lot of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. So that's in the river now. And that supports the uh, uh, nutrients in the river. It supports uh, the minnows, it supports uh, the small crustaceans, the terrestrials in the river, and it supports the insects. So we have a tremendous amount of flies in that river and we have some great hatches in the summer. These, uh, when you see the uh, inch long fingerlings, uh, Pacific salmon going back to the lake in May, you'll see clouds, you'll see thousands of them. It's unbelievable. In the soft sides of the pools, you'll see it dimple like it's raining. And what that is, those juveniles, those fingerlings are feeding on the flakes of last fall's dead salmon carcasses. So it's, it's critical to the, uh, the, the fishery.
Okay, this is the flood of 210. This is the, the lower fly zone and you can see it. The river was uh, about 1300 CFS the day before I was fishing and we got this tremendous uh, rainstorm and it was 26,000 feet the next day. The fly there is a soft tackle. I use a lot of soft tackles. I learned that from another guy that uh, they're, they're very good in the winter months. I, I fish them in different colors and different sizes, but I have a lot of faith in the soft tackle. Flood again, like I said, it was uh, normal flow is 185 to 500 cubic feet per second. This is 26,000. There was actually people as I was standing there watching this, I was with Carl Coleman, we saw guys cross the bridge to fish for salmon in the parking lot over there, even though the river was closed. So these salmon have a have some de devotees for sure. As we get into Pulaski, you see here it took out this uh, retaining wall, and the worry at this point was it was going to cut through and get to the uh, uh, the sewage treatment plant and really screw up the river, it didn't do that. This fly here is a, a, an alvin. These alvins have a big egg, egg yolk. And I just looked at some uh, pictures of real alvins. And I realized that this egg yolk is three times the size of that. So I'm, I'm tying some now to replicate that. The salmon spawn in October, early November. Those eggs hatch in only 90 days. So by mid January, you have these elvins in the reds. They're almost immobile. So the, the red is built to keep them like the eggs, keep them within the red. But when they uh, wash out, it is an easy meal for a steelhead. So that is a, a heck of a pattern. There's a hundred different elvin patterns. You have to decide what you like. We get down to the DSR, beautiful place to fish. Been very crowded. The whole river has been crowded this year because of the COVID. People were just looking to get out of the house and something to do. So it's been a very crowded river. Here you see the famous meadow pool. And it's a, both those pools, the spring hole and the uh, meadow pool are great for that April uh, uh, landlocked salmon push. And you get to the uh, the lake, we're at 300 feet elevation. The village was founded in 1801. The first industry in that village was uh, commercial fishery, fishing for landlines. So uh, Pulaski was formed six years later, 1807. The first name of Pulaski was Fishville. Okay, the, uh, the state does a lot of uh, research on the lake. Uh, there's 11 environmental indicators they, they follow. You can remember 20, 30 years ago and all the warnings about heavy metal warnings about eating these fish. The only warning now is for pregnant women. So the lake is cleaned up. Part of it's zebra mussels, which we'll talk about in, in a little bit. Uh, it does have an impact on the lower food web. But all the indicators uh, of the environment that they they uh, research and follow on these lakes are improving. So that's a great story for all of us. At one time, the lake and river were the greatest in the world for these uh, landlocked Atlantic salmon. It was huge. And you see one here uh, caught in the metal pool back in April in 2014. That's an intruder. A lot of guys swing. If you come up here for steelhead from right about now or in March and April, as that water warms, these fish spawn, they drop back. They've lost up to a quarter of their weight. They're ravenously hungry. The water's warming, they're aggressive. And swinging is a great way to fish for them because you're covering a lot of water and these fish will move for a fly. So that's a good tip for the uh, spring fishery. Uh, the early history of the, it, the uh, Mohawks, they, it's, uh, the, uh, as the Senecas would come up and fish for these salmon in the summer. They didn't stay because the Tug Hill uh, uh, weather was just too tough in the winter. But these were summer run fish and they would come up and fish the lower river 
They are campsites. Uh, the archaeologists have uh, looked at them and examined them. There's just places with hundreds of pieces of pot pottery shards. Uh, there's pottery shards and all the sand along the lake uh, and fronting the Salmon River. So this was a huge fishery for the Native Americans. This is another Alvin pattern that uh, is a, called the Michigan Alvin pattern. You fish it because it looks like a, an Alvin and it also looks like a caddis fly. So a lot of guys use that fly. I've used it on occasion. This is the famous Governor DeWitt Clinton, the uh, most famous for the Erie Canal, but he was an outdoorsman and he was also a fisherman. I think he wrote a book on the fishery in New York back in the day, but he was the first to note the impact of dams on the landlocks. And he was up here in the Oswego area when this, the fishery was on fire, early 1800s. So spawning fish were in every tributary except Niagara River. That's 40 different cribs that these fish were using. And they were well into the Finger Lakes and into Oneida Lake. But uh, uh, the governor was the first to note the dams. We had a tremendous commercial fishery here. The fishery was the uh, centerpiece of the uh, economy back then. We were starting farms. There was logging going on. But uh, like I said before, these fish weighed between 15 and 45 pounds. They were so abundant, people took them with pitchforks. They were often used as fertilizer. Some of the old timers would talk about the family uh, stories that the hired men at these farms would get ticked off because they were fed landlocked salmon every night. So, uh, but it was a secondary income for most of these farmers. So a lot of this property was, was paid for by selling uh, landlocked salmon. It's funny to note that the area right now is uh, the number one piece of the economy is, is the fishery. So we're kind of right back where we started. Okay, here's just some early history, some dates that are not important. What's important is we, we started dam construction in the early 1800s. After the Civil War, there was eight dams. There was total blockage from the headwaters and the spawning areas for these fish. And the commercial fishery was still taking a tremendous load out of the lake. Uh, 1871, Seth Green, who you all are very familiar with, brought in the rainbow trout. He did that because the environmental conditions were deteriorating to the point that brook trout could no longer be sustained. And so he brought in the rainbow trout to, to, uh, to take over from the brookies. So by 1879, we extirpated him from Salmon River. And by the end of the century, they'd extirpated from the entire lake. During that time, that late 1800s, we, we put over a million plus king salmon in the, in the river and over 100,000 plus uh, uh, landlocks. No recovery, no survival, because we never paid attention to the, the environmental degradation that caused the uh, extirpation. So uh, again, we thought hatcheries was the answer. The fly there is a uh, neat little fly I use quite a bit. It's a craft uh, fur streamer. I really like them, time different colors. You can mimic almost any, uh, any forage fish in any watershed you want. Easy to tie. Okay, the environmental storm. How these lakes ever recovered, I have no idea. I do have a presentation on this. You might be interested sometime. And I cover all these different areas of, uh, of uh, pollution. And I didn't put in here human pollution because everything we had that we didn't want, we dumped into these rivers and lakes. And you can see here the commercial fishery. This is, they call them lake herring, but they're really ciscos. That was the primary forage base, the cisco. We are stocking them again. We've been stocking them since 2012 and because the population of smelt is way down and the population of bell wipes is way down, they have a chance of coming back. But still that lower uh, uh, food base, the single celled animals uh, is not as, in, uh, as rich as it used to be. And you see here the, 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 the lumber, it was just unbelievable lumber. Now you take all this lumber out and you mill it, where do you put the 
sawdust. You put it in the rivers. It goes in the rivers. It becomes an impermeable base at the bottom that prevents any natural reproduction of fish and it interrupts the bug life cycle. So it's impermeable. It was so bad that the harbors had to be dredged because a lot of this would end up in the lake and, and, and block up the harbor. So, and you can talk about the, uh, the industry, the mining with the use of water and the chemicals and that going back, the clear cutting, which created a lot of erosion, which warmed the water and, and disturbed the water. Talked about the dams. Farming, we started using uh, fertilizers. The end of Lake Erie was a huge, huge swamp. And that filtered the water going into Lake Erie. Well, they wanted to farm. So they started draining those that, that acreage. They put in over 15,000 miles of drains. And they were successful and they were able to farm it. And immediately we had these huge algae blooms in, in Lake Erie, which we're still having today. And then we have 187 at least invasive species in the lake. Every one has an impact. I threw in a fly here. It's a uh, coffin golden stone. I use it a lot. There's a lot of golden stones in Salmon River. It's a good uh, backup fly. I, I, I always carry them. Okay, the biology of the landlock is that it's a uh, summer run fish, June and July, and they spawn in September, October. Well, when they're spawning, they, they, the king salmon and, and cohos are up there. And so there's competition for reds. There's some aggression. And the, of course, the, the king salmon are bigger fish. So that, that cannot be a, a, of any assistance to our, our landlocks. The other thing is, the state allows people to keep one landlock. Now, if you go upstream, there's still a lot of snag and there's a lot of bad behavior going on. There's a lot of these landlocks taken as they drop back to the lake. Half these people couldn't identify a landlock if they gave them a hundred bucks. So a lot of these landlocks end up at Pineville with these fillet stations. In one year, I got an estimate of 66 in 10 days being filleted out in Pineville. Why the state allows them to keep these fish while they're still trying to develop a self-sustaining population, I don't know. Their egg incubation is fairly long, 150 days. Uh, they produce an elven just like the, uh, the steelhead and then they, they, drop, they drop back to the lake. Some of the large lakes in Canada, these fish remain and become pars, and as the par will stay in the river one to three uh, years. But in, in Sam River, because it's so short, it's only 13 miles to the lower uh, reservoir dam that they drop back at that Sam River. Here you see a cup, here you see a landlock. I put this photo in. This is a Canadian friend with the Canadian Atlantic just to show that they're similar. Their, their DNA is almost identical and they certainly can interbreed. Uh, those albans get to the lake, the growth is rapid, just like our steelhead, just like our brown trout, rapid growth. I mean, a salmon goes from a fingerling in May, two and a half years later to a 30 pound fish. So growth is quick. Now I show you here a, a, a dry fly. This is a royal wolf. When these landlocks run in the summer and get to the headwaters, there is a dry fly bite. This is a large dry fly. We use eights, tens, and twelves. Uh, early on, these fish, uh, there, there may be some people at fish form. These fish see a lot of streamers. They see a lot of nymphs. They don't see a lot of dry flies. So that's a, that's a tip for you if you ever come up to that lower fly or the upper fly zone in the summer. It's a tremendous fish. This is a spawned out salmon, they're called black salmon. So <clears throat> a lot of them are colored up when they drop back. This is a drop back landlock landed in October and it's very bright. Uh, I can tell by its mouth it's a female. Same way with a female steelhead. Once they come off the red, their enzymes change or their hormones change and they sulfur up really quickly. The males hang around for up to a week and they drop back and they're still pretty dark. But that's uh, in Canada, they call these drop back males uh, black salmon. 
like we said before, they're genetically identical, identical to the, almost to the uh, the Atlantic and the in the ocean. Were they voluntarily landlocked because of the uh, ice sheet that that blocked the river centered on uh, El, what is now Alex Bay, or were they uh, voluntary? So the uh, DEC has done some studies with them. There's four landlocks in a museum in Canada from the 1830s. And by examining their scale samples, the best they can figure out, these landlocks voluntarily uh, uh, stayed in, in the lake. That the spawning red or the spawning beds were available, the water flow, the water temp, and the food source uh, was available. So they voluntarily landlocked. That actually happens, and we, they, they've researched on the West Coast with steelhead. The steelhead will be, uh, will be born up on the, some headwaters or one of the streams, and they'll remain because the conditions are, are, are appropriate and will support them, and they don't have to make those long spawning runs. For a landlocked salmon to make a spawning run or Atlantic salmon to make a spawning run into Lake Ontario, that's a 1,200-mile uh, road trip one way. So. Uh, we, th we think they're voluntarily landlocked. Now, one of the p things you hear from fishermen is you can't tell a landlock from a fresh run brown trout because they're silver and they're marked the same. Well, I, I, I'm sure there's some truth to that, but you can see here, your landlocks are very streamlined from making those long spawning runs. A brown trout is much thicker. Brown trout's nickname is a square tail, and, and the uh, landlock has a, a fork tail. Our landlock primarily have X's, although not all landlock have X's. Uh, our primary strain, although there's six strains of landlocks they've tried, is the Sabago Lake strain and it has these X's. And I've, I've never caught one that didn't have the X's. So, Iraq, oh, some have spots. Go ahead. Rock, um... So Atlantic salmon do not die like kings? That's exactly right. They're, they, they, they're related to a Pacific salmon, but they don't die. They, they can spawn three or four times on average. Thank you. And uh, listen, let me tell you something. When you hook a landlock, you will know. I know Dave Cardillo's fish didn't jump. And it didn't have those sizzling runs because it was 50 degree weather, but it put up a significantly long, longer fight than a brown trout. When you get one that's high 40s, 50 degree temperature, you set the hook and you're already looking at it. He's already aerial. He'll jump six or seven times that first 30 seconds. And the runs are twice as long. And I think they're much faster than a steel. I just, it's to me, I'm overwhelmed by these fish. They're, they're just, the hook one is, is a, is a, total experience. So uh, the fight is definitely will tell you what kind of fish you have. The fly I have here, and, and this is this is kind of cool. This is a, a small bloodworm. They're pretty easy to tie. And uh, man, we, we fished uh, that low water for steelhead this year in uh, late October, November. And uh, when the water goes low, the first adjustment a fly fisher would make is to go smaller. So I, I, that water temperature around 50, I've always had a lot of luck with uh, uh, San Juan worms. So I had, I had tied up these blood worms. I hadn't used them for years. And I, I pulled them out. I had a buddy up here and we got talking about it. And we went down and fished for that number 14 blood worm and a number 14 uh, 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 San Juan worm. And we really lit it up uh, for, for a few days. So. Uh, Small fly, low water, it was, a, it was the trick. Some days you solve that little puzzle, some days you don't. Okay, the self-sustaining population, that's the goal of both the province of Ontario and the DEC. And so what are the problems? Well, we got competition with invasives. There's been some habitat remediation. There's been some research on the habitat going on. There's competition with naturalized species. When I say naturalized species, I'm talking about steelhead, brown, domestic rainbows, and Pacific salmon, and, and uh, stocking. Like I say, there's been six strains, 
and we've settled primarily on the Sabago strain, but they're going to try a couple other different ones. What's interesting about the Sabago strain was in the mid 1850s, Sabago Lake itself had problems with their landlocked population, and we gave them Salmon River landlocks to refurbish their population. So we're getting these fish back from Sabago and Maine. We may be getting back the native, uh, the, the original native DNA. So it's, I think that's pretty interesting. We do have natural reproduction going on. I think there's a lot of fish being caught in the lake, although I can't, you know, say that. Uh, I only say that anecdotally, and they're kept. These fish are kept and they're caught in the lake. The lake captains uh, are focused on Pacific salmon. They don't want anything to interfere with stocking Pacific salmon. Some lake captains are afraid if this Atlantic salmon fishery takes off, it will result in diminished stocking of, 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 of Pacific salmon. I think that's a shame, but that, that's where we're at. Now, oh, didn't mean that. Reinforcement, uh, we have very little reinforcement on the Salmon River and I expect the other trips. The state is, a, is in a financial precarious situation the first place they cut is DEC officers. So uh, we don't have a lot of DEC officers. They're busy men. They have hunting season. They have other things to take care of. I very seldom see a DEC agent anymore. When I meet them, they're all gentlemen. We're, we're, they're very professional. And we can be, you can have a lot of fun when we meet them on the river, but we don't have a lot of enforcement. The other part of that uh, equation is the fines aren't big enough. We can't take the guy's car. We can't take his fishing reel. Uh, and the other thing is the fines aren't that big. So there's no real disincentive to go in there and snag fish or keep extra fish. So uh, that's a problem throughout the entire fishery for everything we fish for. Okay, this is the stocking levels. I just, uh, I don't think that's real important. What's important here is we have the DEC that stocks and we have this Tudison lab from Cortland at Stocks, and they do a lot of the research up here. They do the uh, fingerling census in, in May, and I've seen them do that, and they're really, really great people. And that Tunison lab is a really high-tech lab. I'll show you some pictures in a minute. This is a, a bugger I like, I use quite a bit. It's called a collier, or a collier bugger or a vanilla bugger. They're really a, a, a good fly point. This is the Tunison lab down there in Cortland, specialized tanks, UV disinfection to prevent disease. So uh, they're also stocking Cisco's. They've been doing that since uh, uh, 2012. I know they stock them in the Rochester area, so. Juvenile landlocks, when they first uh, stocked these fish, and they did their fingerling samples. They could not identify landlocks. They thought they were browns. They took them back to the lab and looked at them and wow, we got, we got landlock reproduction. The fly here, this is one I use a lot. This is one of the first flies I, I, I tie on all winter and, and that's the Whitlock's uh, red squirrel nail. Uh, I tie it with a really dark, dark, sometimes black uh, thorax. Trout see contrasting colors. So that has really been a good fly. It's, you know, fish is an enamel. It's a soft tackle construction. So a lot of movement. That's really been a, a, a knockout fly for me. Okay, the forge base. And we have a little trouble with our forge base now because of the mussels, but, uh, and we'll talk about the mussels in a little bit. This is the Cisco, the original uh, uh, forge base in the in the lake small slender school fish the perfect forage fish high fat high protein soft grade soft bones and it's a member of the trout family there is a uh, one of the indian river lakes up north of me has these fish in it guys actually fish for them to eat and uh it's uh, i've never eaten one but i've caught them yeah like i say it's the perfect uh, prey fish they, they require really pristine water conditions. And like I say, they've been stocking them since 2012. There was, I think, seven varieties of these uh, Cisco's and they all kind of inhabited a little bit different niche in the lake. 
water depths, shoals, whatever. This is a lake herring seine, but those those were not really herring. These were they were they were netting ciscos. Hey Rocky, I had a question um, from the yeah. audience. Um, what was the name of that uh, last fly that you showed again? The uh... Whitlock's red squirrel net. Okay. And it's it's my favorite steelhead fly, bar none. So, but uh, confidence flies are important because you're fishing better. You you got better focus. So I'm big on confidence flies. And you can ask me questions anytime. I don't mind. This is a native uh, forage, the deep water sculpin. We thought they went away in the 90s, but we, we found them five years later. This is the uh, preferred uh, forage of the lake trout, their bottom dweller. That's a prince nymph. And that's why I started fishing for steelhead years and years ago. The, I fished that exclusively for years and years. And then I, I, I got more versatile or desperate as the case may be. Naturalized invasives. These, you know, these are uh, the brown trout, the steelhead, the domestic, the domestic rainbow. We call it domestic rainbow because they domesticated to spawn in the uh, in the in the fall. They're normally a just like a steelhead or a rainbow of uh, uh, spring spawner. And uh, listen, this fishery's been on fire for a couple of years now with uh, brown trout and. Uh, uh, domestic rainbows. I don't know if they stock domestic rainbows anymore. I haven't been able to check because of this COVID crap, but uh, I, I will. I will have some more information on that. But we had a lot of browns show up this year. People tell me that we have a lot of browns because the lake captains weren't able to go to the lake early this year and they didn't kill a bunch of them. I think it was a stocking uh, thing. I think some got stocked uh, uh, near near the river. But in any event, it's been a great brown trout year. Just fabulous. This little fly here has been very good for me in size 12. It's a egg sucking stone fly. Now, I don't know why it works, but it's one of my confidence flies. So I don't know why I tie flies anymore. I got six I use all the time. <laughs> And of course, Pacific salmon are naturalized. And uh, so, you know, and they're 99% their forage base is the alewife. So we're having problems with the forage base off with these alewives. And the culprit is the king, primarily the king salmon. But uh, the king is stocked more than the coho because it's more expensive to raise the coho. They have to keep the coho in the hatchery for up to a year. So uh, kings are a lot cheaper. So, but. These Pacific salmon have a huge fan base. Uh, so I don't think you're ever gonna see them go away uh, unless there's a real uh, uh, environmental concern. What's good about that fan base though is they're very concerned about the environment. They want these fish every year and they want, the, you know, they want an environment to support that. So we're never gonna go back to those that era in the late 1800s, early 1900s, when we didn't care about the environment. So that in itself is a very good thing. Hey, Rocky. What, yeah. What everybody needs to know when you're showing all these flies is that to go fishing with you, whether it's for steelhead, salmon, or bass, it's like going fishing with a tackle store. Oh, I, I flies from a tackle store. I didn't get everything there, Rob. Uh, it's you got so much stuff. It's like going to a tackle store and oh yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> my hobby's taken over. Yeah, talk to my wife. <laughs> I I refuse to buy any more uh, fly uh, fly tying. I'm using everything I have, so that's why I'm tying different flies now. Okay, we got the lamprey eel. This is a hell of a predator. These are efficient. And they, they're from the ocean. They came up to what we think to the Erie Canal early on, and they decimated uh, the population. They can be so prolific in Cayuga Lake, they had taken care of the uh, trout population. They started taking care of the catfish and the bass. So uh, anyway, they're, they're a very efficient predator. Uh, they, we had some alewives show up. 
We don't know why. It could have been, they could have been part of the shad experiment that Seth Green tried in the 1800s and brought in, when he brought in the shad, he brought some alewives. It could have been a remnant population that was here all along. And when we, the, el the lamprey showed up and, and decimated the predators, the alewives exploded. Or it could have been, they could have come through the Erie Canal. I mean, nobody really knows. But because the, the predators were, were annihilated, the, there was this vacant niche and these, these, uh, the alewives just took off. So uh, that was a, really the death knell of the landlocked salmon originally. You can see the teeth on these uh, uh, lampreys. You know, those of us that are on, on Sam River a lot, we see fish with lampreys on it. Not so much the last couple of years. I think the, uh, the they're maybe reaching their goal of 10% scarring. But uh, if you see one on a fish, you net the fish. If you try to get it off, he will come off. But he's, he's going to attach to you. They're just unbelievable. They're hard to kill. So, uh, and when you're uh, when you're upstream in the spring fishing for steelhead, you'll see them spawn. They have a seven-year life uh, cycle. They spend four years in the tribs. They only predate on fish the final year, the seventh year. And uh, but they're it's cost billion uh, millions of dollars to control these fish or these these eels. Here's some of the uh, controls, variety of barriers and traps. There's a TMF, TFM they use in the chemical they use in the streams. The uh, valgal lucide, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, is used in the river plumes because it's granular and it sinks to the bottom. There's a sterile male release technique where they sterilize males and reintroduce them to the stream. And then there's a, a, a genome project which they're using to research the life cycle and 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 how these uh, eels really live, so they can target uh, uh, target them. So there's a lot of dollars going into this, but like I say, they're a very efficient uh, 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 predator. That's another little uh, a fly, uh, a bloodworm fly. As you uh, go into the estuary here in Salmon River, if you do any swimming, you will be you you will have one inch red. Uh, eels attached to your legs. It's happened to me several times, so I'm sure that may be a good fly. This is one of my favorite flies. This is the Bloody Mary. Red is a good color. I tie all my egg patterns with red thread, so I have a lot of faith in red. We have a lot of clear water conditions. Red is, a, is, a, is the first color you lose in the spectrum, so you need clear water, bright sun, but it's always worked good for me here. Rainbow smelt, people think they're a natural fish. They're not, they came, showed up in the 1870s. Uh, they are a good prey fish. And uh, I don't know if you guys remember the, the, the smelting that we used to do in the Great Lakes and in the Finger Lakes, but it was a lot of fun. Again, they're, uh, I don't see them, I don't hear anybody smelting anymore. I've heard anecdotally there's still some on the uh, western uh, boundary of the lake. That could be because the water coming out of here is a little bit warmer, but uh, I, I, that's all I know about smelt now. This is the uh, L.Y. die-offs, and this was unbelievable back in the day. I know Ralphs has some experience with it. I've had some experience with it, and they would close the beaches here, I and mean, it was just disgusting. And it was just a slight change in temperature would have these alewives uh, die off. So uh, it was a huge problem until we stocked Pacific salmon. And within a couple of years, it didn't happen anymore. The 67 Lake Michigan die off, the next year it was over because they had already, they'd, those uh, salmon they had stocked had reached the adult stage and they had eliminated the problem. This is another Kaufman uh, uh, stonefly. In, we've caught uh, uh, landlocks on that, but in May, early May, people say the steelhead are all gone. The drop backs have gone all the way back to the lake. But usually we'll find steelhead still in the river in the heaviest current fishing indicator 
in a heavily weighted stone fly. So uh, that's a great fly that period uh, when most of the, uh, the dropbacks have gone back and you do have some landlocks in the river. This is the most important fish in the lake right now. And there's, uh, it has a nine year life cycle. So there's nine year groups of alewives in the lake. They showed up in 73. Uh, we already talked about from where. They have thymonase in the skin. Our native fish had not experienced that thymonase and it does three things, weaker eggs, reduce fertility and early mortality syndrome. I think we talked about that. Low B1 content, so uh, low glucose metabolism, low energy, and uh, the fish will die. Here's the trawls. The state does uh, 200 trawls in the lake in, uh, for two weeks in early spring. And they uh, examine each year group to see where we're at. And those year groups have been low for a number of years now. Probably, this is probably the sixth year. It's the third year where we're dropping 20% uh, uh, salmon stock. Now, Pacific salmon, excuse me. We haven't really noticed that yet. And we haven't noticed it because the natural reproduction is, is huge. Sometimes as much as 64% they estimate. And they're doing pen raised uh, salmon production. Those pen uh, raised fish are in the lake. They're run by clubs. They have a two and a half to three times survival uh, uh, rate over the hatchery uh, salmon. So we really haven't seen, uh, 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 noticed the, the, the stocking levels being reduced. But uh, in any event, this water has been gradually warming that uh, should help them. And, uh, but we reduce human uh, uh, pollution, so that shouldn't. But that just a little picture there of the, of the trawl and the, and the results. The round goby, the round goby showed up about 25 years ago. We thought it was the death knell of our fishery. They, they spawn six times a season and they can live between 20 feet and 450 feet. I have a video of 150 feet in the St. Lawrence River, and we have this picture, this, the, 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 the floor of the river covered with uh, gobies. So we took that, we isolated one slide, we tried to uh, isolate a square foot, and we counted 40 gobies in that square foot. So we thought it was going to have a really dramatic impact. But it's soft raid, high oil, high protein, and the bass immediately adapt, uh, adapted to feed on them. The brown trout immediately adapted to feed on them. And I think some of the other trout species are feeding on them. Uh, we know that the uh, Pacific salmon won't because their focus is up and these fish have no air bladder, just like the uh, deep water sculpin, and they're on that bottom 14 inches of, of the lake. Fly, there's another little soft tackle I use, just something I threw together. Uh, there's a deep water sculpin and there's a goby and there's really hard to tell them apart. The only difference is the way the pectorals attach. But other than that, they're the exact same fish, molded appearance and uh, great forage fish. Got two flies here, I got two hair's ears, the regular hair's ear and the uh, soft tackle hair's ear. I think they're both great flies. We get to the, the uh, mussel, which really changed Lake Ontario. Remember 40 years ago, you had some color in the lake, you had a lot of weed growth in the shallower water. Uh, you could use heavy leaders if you're trolling in the lake, you didn't have to use long leaders. So these mussels showed up. So uh, they're an incre incredibly efficient filter feeder. The DEC estimates that the amount of mussels in the lake now filter the volume of Lake Ontario four times a year. That is huge. And what are they filtering and eating? They're e eating those one celled animals that uh, are the base of the food chain. So all of a sudden our lake cleared up. 
Uh, all of a sudden we had to use lighter leaders, longer leads. Uh, it's, it's, it's huge. We even had problems with water intakes for villages filling up and clogging because of these zebra and quagra mussels. So it's been a huge impact on the lake, a few, huge impact on the base of the food chain. So they have changed things. Uh, now the next invasion, if we're lucky, we'll avoid it, but we're totally dependent on the federal government right now is the Asian carp. They escaped from a uh, fish farm in the Mississippi River and they've uh, began a, uh, a expanding all the way to Chicago. There's four varieties, they're voracious. They consume 10% of the body weight a day of plankton. They're very large and they produce unbelievable. Uh, and there's, uh, like I say, there's four varieties of them. If they get in the lake, it's gonna change everything. Right now there's evidence of being in the lake. And they've had problems with the barrier. The DNA was discovered in the lake. I've heard anecdotally that two of these fish were caught in the, in, in the lake. And uh, there's been a lot of money to uh, prevent that because Lake Ontario is a billion dollar industry with all the, uh, the people that visit us. So uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous danger. I just read some research a couple of weeks ago. We always thought that a body of water with no fish could colonize because ducks would get the eggs on their some part of their body, fly into that little lake and colonize the lake. Well, now we know that these ducks, when they're eating the weeds, can ingest eggs, and those eggs can go, go through the digestive system, and they can be viable when they come out the other end, which is a real shit story. Hey, Rob. Yeah. I have a high school friend of mine who manages the water uh, treatment plant for Wilmette, which is a, a northern suburb of Chicago. He's basically said to me, they're in the lake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's gonna be, a, gonna make some huge changes. Thanks, Ralph. Okay, here's some key events. I'm not gonna handle a long, we've already talked about most of this, the sea lamprey control and the, the snagging ban started in 95, it's too late. We got these Pacific salmon from uh, Michigan uh, Department of Natural Resources in the 70s. They said, whatever you do, do not allow snagging. You'll never get it out of the system. And that's, that's exactly right. You go upstream, and you'll see granddad with son and grandson and they're all ripping and, and uh, it's terrible. And not just the snagging, it's the behavior goes along with that. No respect for the fish, no respect for the fishermen, no respect for, uh, for, for anything and all the trash they leave. Now the businesses don't want any enforcement because they're afraid that we'll lose customers. But most of these guys are, a lot of these guys are camping in the woods they're bringing their own beer, they're bringing their own food, and they're leaving their refuse behind. It's sad, it's terrible. And uh, we talked about the reintroduction of landlocked salmon, which is going, I think, fairly well. Uh, I would like to see some changes in how they, they administer it. In the relicense of the dam, we talked about that. This uh, carpetbagger stonefly, I see a lot of guys fishing that now. So I tied some uh, this winter, so I'm going to try it. But I've, I've seen that quite a bit. I know it's very effective on the West Coast. Some more night. These uh, salmon I'm showing you now, they're uh, meadow pool salmon. The meadow pool is uh, great for that spring salmon water, 50. <coughs> spring hole works. I've caught them in the bucket, sycamore. <coughs> and <clears throat> Dave's came out of lower clay. So they, they hold into this lower river that early feeding run. I love the gurgler anyway, but I in the summer we have a tremendous smallmouth bass fishery. I don't know if a lot of guys know about it. 20 years ago we had bass, but it was no big deal. Every year it's gotten better. Of course they've gotten bigger because of the gobies. Uh, June hits around the water's warm enough for them to hit them top water and I, I throw that gurgler quite a bit. 
I like this, uh, uh, this is another guard side fly, a soft tackle streamer. That's another great fly, but uh, I'm a big gurgler fan. You can tie it to make noise. You can tie it just as a slider. And it's been very good for these uh, lake run smallmouth. Fun, fun fishery, geez. Uh, another good fly is the zuck bug. I'm a big fan of, uh, of, of peacock curl. And that's all peacock curl except for the wing. And it's uh, it's been a really good fly over the years for me. That's the, the uh, upper clay, nice picture of it. And there's another meadow pool uh, landlock. This is a DSR I'm talking about. Now, I bring them in because they they sponsor me. Of course, it's a world-class fishery. Most of you guys know about this. So we don't kill trout down there. It's a nice fish. That's the bird nest streamer, or, or, or nymph. I use that quite a bit. I use it in, in tan and uh, uh, olive. Tailwater Lodge taking really good care of me. It's uh, They just built another 40-some rooms. They have a gym and a spa now. And they have their own water out behind it. I'm going to fish it with a couple guys uh, later this week. They designed the rooms to attract spouses. They thought they'd, and I think that worked out very well for them. Very nice place. That's a steelhead I got about eight years ago, or I mean, a landlock in the meadow pool. I could not revive that fish. It was late May. And I got it on a hornbird. Uh, hornbird's a fun fly, too. You fish it dry, and at the end of the drift, you pop it under and fish it like a streamer. I really like that fly. This is a wounded warrior from a program from Maine, and that's a uh, summer run uh, uh, steelhead, the Scamania variety. And I'm, I do a lot of wounded warrior and healing water work now. A lot of soldiers from Fort Drum, I do a, do a lot of presentations on Fort Drum, so I'm connected there. And I know you guys do a lot of wounded warrior, a lot of uh, healing water stuff. And I know we all got interrupted this year, but I want to encourage you to keep keep that up. What some of you don't know about these uh, this generation is this generation of military is the best generation since the World War II guys. They're all volunteers. They all volunteered in the time of war. They all volunteered knowing they're going to get shot at. The oper operational temple of the United States Army is the highest it's ever been in its entire history. So these, there's a lot of combat, a lot of veterans that have spent m multiple tours, and it has an impact. So uh, whatever you can do for these guys, I, I would certainly appreciate. And uh, other than that, thanks so much for the invite. I really appreciate it. Uh, I learn a lot when I do these presentations. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rocky. Um... Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see, I had one comment from uh, Scott to, that uh, mentioning the DEC is no longer stocking domestic rainbows in Lake Ontario and its tribs. Yeah, that's what I thought. But uh, we, we've seen a ton of them the last few years. Yeah. Okay, if you have a question for Rocky, go ahead and unmute and uh, ask away here. What about in the, uh, I've caught landlocks in, uh, in Cayuga Lake, and I know they've been in Seneca Lake. Um, how are they, is the population in those two finger lakes doing compared to Lake Ontario? You know, I don't know. I know there was, uh, five years ago, there was some, some tremendous catches in January in uh, Seneca, or the Watkins Glen Inn. And I know they're stocking them in uh, Cuca. Okay. So uh, I, that tells me that the program is doing pretty well in the finger lake. I've caught very small ones in Skinny Atlas Lake. I mean, they're like the size of trout. <laughs> they're they're yeah. almost the miniature versions of it, but they're beautiful yeah. fish. Here, just the you know, there's some uh, some on the Tug Hill. There's uh, uh, the Fish Creek Club that stocked them in Fish Creek, and I've caught them there. But I, I I'm not sure I, uh, if they, anybody's caught in any size. I mean, I've caught them to nine inches. It's a thrill, and even a nine inch is a thrill to me. But, but there's 20 pounders in Salmon River. Now, do we know what the long term goal is of the Atlantics versus the uh, introduced Pacific salmon? Or, you know, I would hate to be a fisheries manager. <laughs> it is such a fluid 
uh, situation. If the L wives go away, it would make sense to double down on uh, landlocks because uh, you, you'd have emerald shiners, uh, you would have for forage, you would have uh, hopefully the uh, Cisco's. Uh, and they're, you know, I think the landlocks are pretty adaptable. Uh, brown trout are the most adaptable trout. So there may be a push to uh, get get out of this uh, Pacific salmon business because the problem with your alewives is the is the Pacific salmon. I mean, that's that's their their focus. So I I think it's a very fluid situation. Uh, I know there's quite a few people at uh, would like to see the Pacific salmon go away, but uh, realistically, they have such a huge following. It would be hard for a politician to to make any significant cut in the in the Pacific salmon. But I guess the ecology of the lake is going to tell us what what we do need to do next. All right. Um, Anybody else have any questions for Rocky? So I guess not. <laughs> I got everyone's muted, so unmute yourself yeah. if you do. Yeah. Well, if I can do anything for you gentlemen, I would uh, certainly uh, like to. So I appreciate it immensely. No, it was a, a great talk, really uh, educational. Uh. Thanks, Rocky. Great presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Rocky. My pleasure. Hey, Rock. Yeah. What's, what are the key things to look at coming towards spring? Um, is it just water temperature relative to when fishing might pick up? Yeah, of course, water temperature drives the spawning. You know, uh, I think the, the drop back steelhead are, 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 are a lot of fun because they're very aggressive. They have to eat. And, uh, you know, so you're, you're always captured by weather. Uh, but the other thing that's impacting on us now is crowds. I mean, the river was crowded this year. There's no two ways about it. Fly zones have been crowded all winter. Uh, this COVID is, you know, people just want to get out and do something. So uh, people are talking about a resurgence in fly fish, fishing. Like when we had the movie, the river runs through it. You know how that everything perked up. And they're saying that COVID may have the same kind of impact on our sport. That'd be one of the few positives. <laughs> of, yeah. of this I had my but, second uh, shot. I'm good. Well, I'm some free. people, Gordon, some people may look at that as a positive. I'm not one of them. No, I'm <laughs> yeah, scared silly about getting that thing. So <laughs> it's not the COVID, the number of people, but that's yeah. me. Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> Tough. Well, if you guys come up this way, call me. I always, I, I always have pretty good information on what's going on. So, no, I will definitely. Thanks, Rock. Yeah, I enjoyed it, gentlemen. Thanks so much. Okay, so uh, thanks everyone for coming out tonight. Um, really great presentation, and um, we'll see you in March. If you have any ideas of what you want us to do, uh, uh, send, shoot me an email or or call me or whatever, but. Um, thanks, Rocky. Yeah, thanks, Rocky. Thank you. <laughs> nice joining you guys, so. Nobody threw anything at me, that's cool. There <laughs> 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 we go.